three to one. There's a story that's told of a Russian lieutenant who was working in the palace of the Tsar during the time of Nicholas II in, in Russia. <clears throat> now this lieutenant was really good at his job. In fact, he kept getting promoted and promoted until finally he was working in the palace, like I said, of, of the Russian Tsar. Now, the one problem that he had was that he really liked to gamble. Now, he also wasn't very good at gambling. And so he kept finding himself in more and more debt. Finally, late one night, he got back to his room after losing a lot more money than he had ever lost before. And he sat down, turned on his lamp, and began to write on a piece of paper all of his debts. The list kept going on and on, till finally he couldn't write anything more. In fact, he decided to just write at the bottom of the page, the debt is too great. Who can pay it? Very upset and frustrated, he went to bed. That same night, the Tsar was walking around as he always did, and he saw that the light was on in his lieutenant's room. Curious to find out why he was up so late, he walked by, didn't hear anything, thought, okay, he must be asleep, put his ear to the door, walked in, went over to the lamp to turn it off, and <clears throat> As he was about to turn off the lamp, his eyes caught on, on a piece of paper that was on the desk there. And he looked down and he saw the phrase, the debt is too great, who can pay it? Thinking for a second, he grabbed the pen and wrote down, I, Nicholas II, King of, uh, Tsar of all Russia. Sometimes don't we find ourselves adding up the debt in our life, adding up the bad things that we do in our life. I cheated. I lied. I didn't have self-control. The list goes on and on, so much so that we get to the point, just like the lieutenant, where we say, the debt's too great. Who can pay it? Now, we know because of the Bible that Jesus comes by and he says, I, Jesus, king of all the universe, can pay it. So how should we respond once we've understood this? In, this, in our text this afternoon, we're going to be looking at what Paul tells the Romans and Christians everywhere how they should respond once they've understood what Jesus did for them in his saving act. This morning, we are going to look in Romans 5. So if you'll turn in your Bibles uh, with me to Romans 5 in the New Testament, right after Acts, before 1 Corinthians, Romans 5. And as you're turning there, I'll give you a brief background about what the letter to the Romans is about. Now, Paul had been working in the Eastern Mediterranean, going throughout all of Greece and modern-day Turkey, starting up new churches. After starting so many churches, he decided he wanted to go to a new chartered area, a new chartered territory where he could start some more churches. He decided he wanted to go to Spain. So a good stopping point on the way from Jerusalem, Greece, that area, over to Spain would be in Rome where there already was a strong group of Christians. In fact, Paul mentions at the end of his chapter that there are some people who have been Christians in Rome longer than Paul has been a Christian. So what is it that Paul says to these Romans who had been there for a while? Let's read verse 1, Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul begins with the word, therefore. Now the word therefore implies that something came before that. So what is it that Paul was talking about? In verse 1, actually, it says what Paul was talking about. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Before that, Paul was talking about justification by faith. The chapters between uh, chapters 3 through 5, he discusses that topic. Let's turn to Romans chapter 3 verses 21 through the first half of 25, where Paul really just tells what justification by faith is. I'll read now in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. He says there in verse 23 that all have sinned, that none of us can reach God's glory. 
which is a pretty sad thing to think about. We're imperfect. God's perfect. We can never get there. But then in verse 24, he says that we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, basically, Paul says that if we admit that we are ungodly and we believe we're justified by the righteousness of God and the perfect life that he lived through his sacrifice, we can be righteous in the eyes of God. E.J. Wagner, an early Adventist theologian who wrote extensively on the subject of justification by faith, speaking on Romans 5, said, This is the only way that anybody in this world can ever become righteous. First admit that he is ungodly, then believe that God justifies, counts righteous, the ungodly, and he is righteous with the very righteousness of God. Thus strange as it may sound to many, the only qualification and the only preparation for justification it's for a person to acknowledge that he is ungodly. So we can only become righteous in the eyes of God by accepting what Jesus did for us. Now, what is this faith that justification by faith talks about? Once again, Wagner, talking on faith, sa um, says this. Faith is the depending upon the word of God only, and expecting that word only to do what the word says. Now, this is depending on the word of God is faith. Recognizing our ungodliness and having no access to him, we have to rely completely on him, on his word. There's no greater example of this than Abraham, a man who the New Testament talks about over and over again, is a man of great faith. You might remember the story in Genesis where Abraham is promised a son. Now, God promises him that he'll have a son who will have all the nations will come from him, come from his son. Now, Abraham started getting older and older wasn't having a son with his wife, Sarah. Finally, he said, you know, I'll, I'll take Sarah's servant and we'll try and have a baby that way. Has a baby. And God says, nope, that's, that's not the promised child that, that you were waiting for. <clears throat> then when Abraham turns 99 and Sarah's 89, finally they have a baby. Now, it was impossible for Sarah and Abraham to have a baby at the ages of 89 and 99 well past the age of childbearing, for, especially for Sarah. Now, Abraham had to depend completely on what God said, on what God did, rather than depending on what he could do. That is justification by faith, a good example of great faith. Put simply, justification by faith is this. If we are open to God, to what Jesus did, we're covered. By what he did. To be covered means that Jesus will take care of our past. He'll forgive us. Also, our imperfect lives are covered by his perfection. We have, and then we also have hope for a judgment day that's to come where we will be covered by what Jesus did in his sacrifice. Recently, I heard an acronym that works very well for this. It's the word grace. God's redeeming act covers everything. Now, the subject of justification by faith and that this idea from Romans 3 and what Paul talks about in Romans 5 isn't something that's common to all churches, all denominations, and even within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there are many people who don't quite understand this and, or grasp it. We so often want to do everything on our own. We want to save ourselves by our own works. We focus on the rights and the wrongs and the do's and thou, thou shalt nots rather than understanding what Jesus did for us. Paul demonstrates in Romans that we're justified by receiving Jesus in faith, faith that's rooted in the word of God. Writing on the subject of, of justification by faith, Ellen G. White says, This, justification by faith, is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a large measure. Now, understanding justification by faith, let's move on and look at what Paul tells the Romans to do once they've understood justification by faith. Let's read verse 1 again. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? The first thing, peace with God. We have peace with God. Talking about this first fruit of justification by faith, John Stott, an Anglican uh, pastor and theologian who wrote extensively on Romans called this a reconciled relationship with God. 
So basically, God is perfect, and humans are imperfect. When we think of peace, we think of an absence of war. That means that at one point, we did not have peace with God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that because we're imperfect and God is perfect and we can't exist together, we are enemies with God. But God's not the one doing the fighting against us. We're the ones who are fighting against God. I'm reminded of a story I heard of a man who fell out of a boat and was got really worried in the water, disoriented about where he was going, started swimming, realizing, wait, I might be going up, I might be going down, I don't know if I'm, where I'm going. Then he came to the realization, if I just relax, I'm wearing a life jacket, it'll reorient me, it'll pull me to the top. Justification by faith works a lot like this. We try and do it ourselves, but we have a life jacket. We can turn to Jesus, and he'll reorient us and bring us back to the top. We'll have peace <coughs> excuse me, with God. Now, this is something that has happened in the past. <coughs> in fact, later on in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, <coughs> But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is something that God, Jesus already did for us in the past. God wants us to have peace with others. <coughs> so when we have peace with God, also God wants us to help, help break those tensions between us and those around us. Let's move on to the next thing that Paul says. Understanding that we have peace with God. Verse 2. <coughs> Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's focus real quick on the first half of that. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. <coughs> a few years ago, while I was in high school, I went on a trip to Washington, D.C. Now, we did the typical things that you do in Washington, D.C., we went to the mall area, not the shopping mall, the mall where everything is. Went to the Capitol, Smithsonian, Washington Monument, Lincoln Monument, visited the White House. But one thing that we did that was of particular interest to us that we knew was happening beforehand was we, we attended a Veterans Day ceremony at Arlington Cemetery. Now why this event was so special was because the then President Barack Obama was going to be the main speaker. Arriving, we could tell that his imminent presence was, was coming because there were, so, there were Secret Service policemen everywhere. Dark suits, sunglasses, earpieces. We had, to, we had to go through so much security just to get to the rotunda or the amphitheater where we were. In fact, we had to go through metal detectors. They looked through all of our backpacks. They used the metal detecting wand all over us to make sure that we didn't have anything. Finally, we got into the area. Now, we found pretty good seats. We were about 100 feet, probably, from the main stage. <clears throat> but as it, how it worked was there were seats in the middle, seats around, and a platform. And right near the platform, there was an area that was marked off um, with military personnel and very important people who were allowed there. I actually got the chance to meet David Robinson, a former NBA player for the San Antonio Spurs, who was also attending the event. And he was sitting up around us where we weren't really allowed to go, but even he wasn't allowed into that special place where it was meant for just the president. So it was, I was in high school and I was the president of the student body at WAVA, so I thought to myself, you know, we presidents should stick together. I should probably be sitting with him. So I stood up and walked kind of quickly over towards there, and pretty quickly I realized that they didn't want me there. And I realized, I mean, I was tackled by five security officers, handcuffed and questioned for four hours. Right, obviously that didn't actually happen. But that is what would have happened if I had done that. Because only people who have clearance can be where the president is. Much like that, only those who are perfect can be where God is. Imagine a courtroom. Maybe the, maybe the story of Esther, if you've heard that, where only the advisors and the king were the only way to get in is to have an introduction or to be invited. Now, this sounds kind of scary because we can't get in there, right? We're imperfect. 
But the greatest thing is that we know somebody who can get us in there. Jesus is the one who gave us our introduction. John Stott says that the literal translation of this verse should be, through him, Jesus, we've obtained our introduction into this grace in which we have taken our stand. Jesus gives us an introduction into that courtroom so that we can be in constant communication with God. Remember justification by faith? Remember grace, God's redeeming act, covers everything? Now we can stand. We can stand. We have constant access to God. Not only can we stand, but Stott goes on to say that justified believers, that's us, enjoy a blessing far greater than just a periodic approach to God or an occasional audience with the king. We're privileged to live in the temple and in the palace. Constant access to God because of what Jesus did for us. Now let's read the rest of verse 2. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we've seen that we have peace, we have access, and even more, here Paul says, we have a reason to rejoice. Some people say, some scholars say that the better translation of the word rejoice is glory, boast, triumph. The word is more than just rejoicing. We have reason to share it with others. This isn't something that we can just hear and keep inside of ourselves. This is something that we have to share to the world. As Ellen White says, it's the third angel's message. It needs to go to the world. No longer can we try and work our way into heaven. Into heaven. <clears throat> it's so easy to fall into that. We do good things so we think that we can get to heaven. But that's not what Paul teaches here. The gospel is that he came to save us. Jesus came to save us even while we were not alive. Sometimes as Christians, especially for me and for those of us who grew up in a Christian uh, environment, it's so easy to forget what the story of salvation is about. So we, we get accustomed to it. We grow numb to it. But Paul tells the people in Romans to wake up. He tells Christians everywhere, wake up. We've seen that the fruits of justification are threefold, past, present, and future. Peace. We have peace with God. That's a past thing because of what Jesus has done. He's forgiven us. He already has forgiven us for our sins before we even commit them. The second one, we have access to stand with God. It's present. We have a constant access to God, constant dialogue with God. There's nothing that separates us between, nothing that separates us and God. And the last thing that Paul says here is that we rejoice in hope. We have a hope for a future because in the judgment day, Jesus is going to take our place. And Jesus rose again. So we should be rejoicing, boasting, even triumphing. Let's read the rest from verses 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul says that we can also rejoice through our sufferings and that we should not be ashamed. Now speaking on suffering, John Stott says this, we're not to rejoice in our tribulations, not masochism, which is the sickness of finding pleasure and pain. It's rather the recognition that there is a divine rationale behind suffering. Because of our constant connection to God, we have reason to rejoice, always, despite suffering. Also, as a result of justification by faith, it says that we're given the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit spreads love throughout our heart and into our lives. We have constant access to God, constant access to that love. Nobody puts it better than Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, where he tells us about how nothing can separate us from God's love. He says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, 
how should we respond to this love of God as portrayed in justification by faith, as portrayed in what Jesus did for us? We should rejoice because of our connection to God through Jesus Christ. Like I've said, we try and do it on our own. Maybe you know we read our Bibles and we volunteer around, and these are all great things to do. But they can't save us. They can't get us to heaven. We've learned today that the only way to be saved is through Jesus, who offered himself as a sacrifice for us and lived a perfect life in our place, and who will stand in our place in judgment. Are we enjoying this connection? Do we come boldly to the throne? How might the fact that we rejoice in our, con in our connection to God through Jesus Christ affect our lives today? Maybe recently you had another fight with your, with your boyfriend or girlfriend or with a close friend of yours. And you want to talk to God, but you've done it in the past and it really hasn't helped much. Remember today that you have a connection with God and that God wants you to be at peace with others just like you are at peace with him because of what Jesus did for you. Maybe you're feeling distant because you've, you've been going through some pain lately. You've been suffering. Your close friend of yours is in the hospital or has recently died. But remember that Jesus wants to be in connection with you. God wants to be in connection with you. We have constant access to God, and he wants to be with us through everything. And we have a reason to rejoice despite all of these pains and sorrows that we go through. It may be five years from now when... When you lose a close friend or lose a spouse, and you remember Romans 5. Romans 5 tells you that we have reason to rejoice because there's hope. We have hope to see them again someday because Jesus and what he did for us. And so what is the result of understanding that Jesus, what Jesus did for us? We've seen this afternoon that we always have a reason to rejoice in our connection to God through Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We have access to God. And we can rejoice in God's promises of a future. Let us all rejoice now, knowing that God has offered us the free gift of salvation through Jesus as we look forward to a future with him. Let's pause to thank him for this as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning. Thank you for giving us a reason to rejoice, a reason to, to look forward to the future. We have hope. We have peace with you now because you've forgiven us. We have constant access to you now. And we have a hope of seeing you and seeing our loved ones again someday. Please draw us close to you and be with us. In Jesus' name.